Leia here from LeiaForSci.com and in this video we'll look at the reaction, a shortcut trick, and mechanism for the ozonolysis of alkenes. You can catch this entire video series along with my alkene practice quiz and cheat sheet by visiting my website LeiaForSci.com slash alkene reactions. Ozonolysis, as the name implies, comes from ozone, which is the molecule O3, and lysis, to break. In the ozonolysis of alkenes, you react not only the carbon to carbon pi bond, but you also break the carbon to carbon sigma bond, completely separating the two carbons from each other. You'll likely cover two or three types of ozonolysis reactions. Each one involves the reaction of an alkene with ozone. It's simply a question of what you use in the final step. The most common reaction you'll see is the reductive workup. That's where you start with ozone and follow with reductive conditions such as DMS, dimethyl sulfide, which is CH32S, or zinc and acetic acid. For every reaction we break the pi bond, but under reductive conditions, any secondary carbons, meaning they start out tertiary and then break up to be secondary, will wind up as an alkene. And any secondary carbons, when broken, become primary, will form an aldehyde. The next type of reaction you'll see, once again, starts with the use of ozone, but this time we follow up with oxidative conditions, such as H2O2 hydrogen peroxide. In this case, you get the same types of products, meaning the tertiary becomes a secondary carbon and therefore a ketone. The only difference is that the aldehyde will be oxidized so that instead of having an aldehyde, you have an extra oxygen in that molecule, giving you a carboxylic acid. The least common one in a general organic chemistry course is starting with very reductive conditions so that if you have ozone followed by a very strong reducing agent, sodium borohydride, NaBH4, you have reduced carbonyls, which are actually alcohols. The tertiary carbon, which is broken, becomes secondary, and that's a secondary alcohol. The secondary carbon, which is broken to become primary, becomes a primary alcohol. If it doesn't look familiar, ignore it, because most professors will not cover this in undergrad organic chemistry. So let's go back to the initial molecule we looked at. Trying to figure out the products of an ozonolysis reaction can be tricky, but if you know what you're looking for, it's easy to come up with the products. We know that this is an oxidative cleavage reaction, meaning we're cutting the two carbons apart. So what you want to do is just slice and dice. Slice that carbon to carbon double bond in half and put an oxygen next to that break on either side so they're on both carbons. Let's put this in reductive conditions. So we'll have O3 in step one, CH32S or DMS in step two. And then all you have to do is redraw it exactly as you see it. So this was our molecule. This is where we broke it, and anywhere we have a break, just put an oxygen in. We have a ketone for the first fragment and aldehyde for the second fragment. You can make this more obvious by just sticking an H on there. If this was under oxidative conditions, just put an O there and put a hydrogen on it. If you have a linear alkene, you cut the chain in two. But it gets a little more exciting when you have a cycloalkene. The trick is the same. Slice the pi bond in the middle and put an oxygen exactly where you see it. For this one, let's do oxidative conditions, O3 in H2O2. We'll redraw the chain exactly as we see it, so that you have a pi bond cut in half. Then we add in the oxygen atoms for the carbonyl, but since it's oxidative, instead of just putting an H for the aldehyde, we put an OH for a carboxylic acid. What we have here is the correct answer, and you can leave it like this, but if you want to see it in linear form, I recommend numbering and redrawing. This way, you won't get confused if the molecule doesn't look exactly the same. What we have is a six carbon chain, so we'll just put the word redraw, we're not changing anything, and draw out your six carbons. Next we look for what we have on the chain. On carbon one, we have a carboxylic acid. On carbon six, we have a carboxylic acid, and that's the same product. The final thing you want to pay attention to is the specific functional groups that you get when you break that pi bond. We've already shown that if you have a tri-substituted carbon or tertiary carbon, it winds up giving you a ketone. 
and this is under oxidative and reductive conditions. We also saw that a secondary carbon, which when it breaks becomes primary, can give you an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid, depending on if it's reduced under oxidative or reductive conditions. But what happens if the pi bond that you're breaking is terminal? If we break this in half, we have a disubstituted carbon. It's secondary. It will become primary. We know it'll be an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. But what happens to this carbon over here? Don't forget that it has two hydrogen atoms. So if you're doing this under reductive conditions, O3, DMS, the first product, as expected, is an aldehyde. The second product is a carbon atom with the two hydrogen atoms attached to it and a carbonyl. Exactly the same as if it was a longer chain, but because we're starting with two hydrogen atoms on that carbon, we end with two hydrogens giving us formaldehyde. But if we react the same molecule under oxidative conditions, we have to add that extra oxygen to both carbons. So our fragments will have carbons double bound to oxygen with an extra OH on each carbon. Let's not forget the one hydrogen. So what we got was a longer chain carboxylic acid and a single carbon carboxylic acid. This is slightly different from a similar reaction, reacting with KMnO4, where the single carbon product will be carbon dioxide. Here, it's still a carboxylic acid. In case you're one of the lucky few required to know the mechanism, let's break it down. Since the reductive workup is the most common, let's take a look at the ozonolysis reaction ending with DMS in the last step. Before we look at the mechanism itself, let's review the structure of ozone. Ozone is O3, which is an oxygen bound to an oxygen bound to an oxygen. But if we try to fill in the electrons, octets, and formal charge, you'll notice that you have the option of putting a pi bond on one side, giving that oxygen two lone pairs, no formal charge. The next oxygen will only have one lone pair and a formal charge of plus one. And the last oxygen will have three lone pairs and a formal charge of minus one. If you're not comfortable with this, go back to my formal charge video and make sure you understand. This molecule can undergo resonance so that the negative oxygen attacks the positive oxygen, kicking out the final electrons towards the left. And the resonance structure will look exactly like the first ozone except that it's reversed. So the green electrons are now sitting as a pi bond between itself and the central oxygen. That oxygen is still stuck with that positive charge, nothing it can do about it. But now the oxygen on the left, in addition to its two starting lone pairs, has the purple electrons as a lone pair and a formal charge of negative one. One more thing you want to remember is that oxygen to oxygen bonds are very unstable. That's why you see them a lot in radical reactions. We have to pay attention to that in the mechanism. We'll start with a simple alkene, cis-2-butene, so that we can focus on the mechanism rather than the reactants, knowing that the products will be two equivalents of ethanol. The first step in this mechanism is a 1,3 cycloaddition. So even though we're showing this as three separate arrows, understand that they happen simultaneously. We have the negative oxygen's electrons reaching out for one of the carbons on the pi bond. This would form too many bonds on that carbon atom, so the electrons in the pi bond get kicked out. Where do they go? They find a willing recipient, the oxygen on the other end of ozone. How is that possible? When these electrons move, the resonance starts to favor the green electrons shifting over in the other direction. The green electrons are drawn to the other side, but we can show them as a lone pair collapsing onto the oxygen atom. Starting to make this one partially positive if its electrons get pulled away. That deficiency is filled by the pi electron. So remember, it's all happening at the same time to give us a very unstable intermediate, a malosinide. Let's draw the atoms exactly as we see it. We now only have one red bond between the two carbons and not two because the pi bond moved. The red electrons are now sitting as a sigma bond between itself and oxygen. The oxygen on the left is bound to carbon with the black electrons that used to be the negative lone pair. Let's not forget all the other electrons. What happened to the positive charge on the middle oxygen? It no longer has a formal charge because it now has two lone pairs of electrons and two sigma bonds to the other oxygen atoms. 
the melosanide has no formal charges but it's still very very unstable because you have three oxygens single bound one to another and that just doesn't work in fact it's so unstable the entire thing is going to collapse this is another cyclo addition but this is a retro it's almost like an opposite cyclo addition because now we're breaking it up instead of making a ring We'll show the lone pair on the left oxygen in orange, coming down to attack the carbon forming a pi bond between them. Carbon would have too many bonds, so it has to kick something out. And what it kicks out are the electrons that form a sigma bond between itself and the other carbon. These electrons don't get kicked onto carbon. Instead, they get kicked towards the oxygen atom so that you form a pi bond between carbon and oxygen. That means this oxygen now has too many electrons in its octet and it has to kick something else out. So it'll kick out these blue electrons and collapse them onto the oxygen atom in the middle. So let's see what happens as a result. We'll start by drawing the atoms exactly as we see them. So we have two green carbons, two blue carbons, and three oxygen atoms. The green carbon atom had a black sigma bond and now gets an orange pi bond to the oxygen atom. The first oxygen is attached to the middle oxygen by a sigma bond. It has one lone pair and a positive charge. The upper or the middle oxygen has the purple original lone pair, the green lone pair from the last step, and now the blue lone pair that it just acquired for a net charge of negative one. The purple oxygen on the right was single bound to the blue carbon. Now it's double bound by the electrons that collapse from the carbon to carbon single bond. The molecule on the right looks perfectly stable. Don't forget we have invisible hydrogen atoms. That's an aldehyde. That's what we want. The problem is the molecule on the left is very unstable and it will attack. So let's go ahead and redraw them a little more clearly. We have the two green carbons We'll simplify it as a pi bond to the oxygen atom. One is positive, the other one is negative. And keep in mind that these things are moving around, they're floating around the solution, rotating and flipping. And at some point, this small molecule will find itself upside down near the negative oxygen. So we'll show the oxygen atom here, double bound to the blue carbon chain. The next step is important. Carbonyl bonds, the pi bond between carbon and oxygen, can undergo resonance, has that unequal distribution of electrons so that the carbonyl carbon is partially positive and the carbonyl oxygen is partially negative. The partially positive carbonyl carbon acts as an electrophile, the negative oxygen acts as a nucleophile, and we get a nucleophilic attack from oxygen to the carbonyl carbon. The blue carbon now has too many bonds, so what does it do? It has to get rid of its pi bond by collapsing it as a lone pair onto oxygen, which then reaches out and attacks the other carbonyl carbon, which is also partially positive. That causes the electrons in its pi bond to collapse onto the positive oxygen, giving it a second lone pair. So we went from a melosonide to another wacky intermediate, the ozonide. Let's redraw the atoms exactly as we see them. We have the two green and two blue carbon atoms. We have the two purple oxygen atoms on top, one on the bottom. The green carbon is now single bound to oxygen, which is single bound to the other oxygen, which is now single bound to the blue carbon. The blue carbon is single bound to the lower oxygen, which is also single bound to the green carbon. Every oxygen atom has two bonds, two lone pairs. That means we have no formal charges, but again, it's not very stable. This reaction is carried out at low temperatures, so it'll stay as is, waiting for the next step. And the next step we'll look at for the reductive workup is the addition of DMS. DMS, or dimethyl sulfide, is CH32S. We'll show the sulfur atom with the two methyl substituents coming in with its lone pair of electrons to attack one of the oxygen atoms. It looks for the less substituted, but in this case, they're both the same. 
When sulfur attacks oxygen, oxygen has too many electrons, and it lets go of the unfavorable bond between itself and the other oxygen. These electrons will collapse down towards the carbon, forming a pi bond between itself and carbon. That gives carbon too many electrons, so carbon has to let go of its bond to oxygen, which will move towards the other carbon-oxygen in-between space. That'll form another pi bond between oxygen and carbon, which means carbon has to let go of the other oxygen that it's holding onto. The electrons will collapse back onto the oxygen atom. If you're having trouble following this, pay attention to the colors and see where everything went. Once again, we'll start by drawing the atoms exactly as we see them. Two green carbons, two blue carbons, two oxygens on top, one oxygen below. Here's where we start to see our products. The green carbon had a single bond to oxygen. It now gets a second bond to oxygen. The blue carbon had a blue single bond to the lower oxygen, now has an orange double bond to that same oxygen. And the third oxygen is now bound to sulfur, which has two methyl groups attached. Let's not forget all our lone pairs. The two oxygens bound to carbon are neutral. They have two lone pairs, two bonds, one sigma, one pi, so they're good to go. The third oxygen has an extra lone pair of electrons, giving it a negative charge, bound to a sulfur, which has a deficiency because it attacked, giving it a positive charge. And you can show resonance where the negative attacks the positive. You don't necessarily have to. What I do want you to recognize, though, is that this is DMSO, a solvent we've seen a lot in SN2 reactions. We have our products, but it doesn't hurt to redraw them just to make sure they look clean and clear. We have an aldehyde made from the first part of the molecule, the green carbon chain, and another aldehyde from the second part of the molecule, the blue carbon chain. If you're overwhelmed, first find out if you even need to know this mechanism. If you don't, just go right back to the beginning of the video and learn the trick. If you have to know it, I recommend copying step by step from the video, then restarting the problem, see how far you can go, and when you get stuck, Go back to the video and copy the rest of it step by step and see if every time you start this exercise you can get a little further, a little further until you have the entire thing memorized. Once you have this down, be sure to try the alkene reaction practice quiz and download the cheat sheet by visiting my website layerforsci.com slash alkene reactions. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for resources and information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, then I have a deal for you. A free copy of my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry. Use the link below or visit orgosecrets.com to grab your free copy. After downloading your free copy of my ebook, you'll begin receiving my exclusive email updates with cheat sheets, reaction guides, study tips, and so much more. You'll also be the first to know when I have a new video or live review coming up. If you enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up and share it with your organic chemistry friends and classmates. I will be uploading many videos over the course of the semester, so if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, do so right now to be sure that you don't miss out.